is the economic manipulation display. What this does is you're trying to gain political points. You can do it by manipulation here. So what you would do before your economic phase came is let's say you want to give yourself plus one on the political status board to go up. Then you go plus one and it will cost you eight manpower points. So when you go to do your build, you have to subtract eight off your manpower. So it's eight less strength points you'll be building. Uh, it costs you nothing in the money. If you want to go money, then you put your marker in this box. It'll cost you $18, but no manpower. And then if you really want to get crazy and go up two, it'll cost you $28 and 10 manpower. But your economic status marker will go up. Okay, so we use this economic manipulation chart. And then likewise, if you want to move down the table because you need money, then you move the marker on this side. If you need manpower, you come down this side. We're going to start with some strategies. Now these strategies are overall strategies that every player would know about the other players. It's nothing secret. It's just to have an overall strategic uh, mindset of what is going on. Uh, little individual uh, strategies that you're going to have for your country, you can formulate yourself or ask questions. Go to the Board Game Geek website, find out. But what we'll discuss here is pretty general knowledge. We just got to make sure... Uh, everybody understands what that is because you guys have never played the game. So, let's start with the French strategy. So, what I would do as any nation is calculate how many victory points you need to win this game by the end of 1815. For the French, it's almost, it's about 9 points, a little more than 9 points. So, maybe 10 points a turn. You can see where they start on the board here. They're already starting close to that. So the French, to stay up in this dominant zone here, would need to keep collecting political status points. Keep moving up on this board. Remember, every political status point you collect, you're moving up on this board, which in turn, during the economic phase, every three months, wherever this marker is, you're going to get that amount of victory points. If the French want to win the game earlier, because remember, whoever hits their number the moment that turns over the game ends so the French could do it in four years five years whatever if he's collecting more than his average he needs which is nine so if he's collecting 14 points a turn he's gonna get there way before 1815 every player needs to pay attention to who is doing what on the political status board and where they're at. Now with that being said, when you read, I've been reading a lot of games of Empire and Arms over the years. I like the game, I've always looked at how other people were playing it. And there's a lot of crazy things that people do in this game. I've seen the French player get beat up by every single nation declaring war on him, go down, he's subdued, he, he's conquered, Yet the way this game works, he'll be conquered, but he's still in the game. He's just not dominating and he can't do anything. And he slowly will work his way back into the game eventually and people will start allying with him because remember, once he was conquered, the other nations start battling for control and now they're beating each other up. And then they look for France for help and so on and so on this goes. So in this game, Every country here can get conquered probably like twice and still be in the game to win. It's a very unique situation this game has like that. Diplomacy is a big part. Now, maybe the British, because the British don't have a big army. All they have are fleets. Fleets are very expensive to build. Maybe once the British get conquered, they may not be able to come back into this game. But other than that, everybody else really can so the only rule we start with as far as diplomacy is is that the French and the British are at war period 
other than that you guys can do whatever you want you can make whatever alliances you want you can come up with whatever whatever plans you want and also I should mention not only can you declare war on anybody you want but you can also make peace anytime so you can declare with this guy fight him for a few turns and then go to peace and just like the me and the French we start the game at war but if we wish we can make peace with each other and that's just to protect against everybody else if they try to get crazy and someone wants to pull out of a war me or the French with each other we can I want you to listen to everything I have to say here because I want to be careful how I start out with this because we're new at the game for somebody to come up with some crazy plan I think it's kind of ridiculous because we really don't know how it's work. You won't know how it works. And it could turn this game really into something that you didn't expect it to be. But, hey, you're willing to try whatever. All you have to do is get somebody to go with your crazy plan. Usually you find the weak links and you do that. Now, with all that being said, because we're new, I'm just going to give you a strategy that new guys may tend to follow. For example, we're going to discuss the French. If I were the French player, not if, just if I am the French player and I'm new at this game, immediately I'm thinking, wow, I'm at war with Britain. So that's a Navy issue. That's something I have to deal with. That's some other plan I have to formulate. I'm not going to talk about that this minute. I would say right away, if I want to continue to collect my nine or ten victory points every turn, the fastest way to do that is to keep fighting, winning battles, and conquering nations. Well, the two easiest ones for me to do that with is Austria and Prussia. They're just going to be the easiest. England's going to be a little more difficult. Conquering the Spanish right away is going to be a little more difficult for the French. So the only other choices they have is Austria and Prussia. Now, they don't have to choose to fight Austria or Prussia. Let's say they make a treaty with Austria. They can choose to say, hey, let's take out Prussia and you take care of that side of the board and let me concentrate on conquering Spain and England so I mean there's other ways to go about it I'm just not experienced enough in the game to know if fighting the Spanish or even fighting the English small army is enough to give you enough victory points to keep going or how long it would even take you you might be able to do it pretty quick I think it comes down to if you can defeat the Navy or not with the English and then the Spanish, it might take you a while because of their guerrilla special rules. So again, it leads us right back to Austria. They can conquer Austria, win battles, keep themselves up on the political status, and then conquer Prussia. That would be their strategy. If I was the French player, I'd be very happy, that, happy to do that as a new player. After them two are conquered, then you can formulate maybe who you go after next, Maybe you can be building ships that whole time and then turn around and go after England. Or you can maybe decide to conquer Spain. Now remember, once you conquer a nation like Austria or Prussia, eventually they come back in the war and you'll have to fight them again. Unless you keep them on your side. And that's what this game's all about. Diplomacy, manipulating people, making sure people aren't headstrong and only thinking one way in this game. Things are going to change. And I mean, they will change 300 and 60 degrees it's it's just it's crazy don't get headstrong into doing one specific thing all the time we're just talking about if the french want to win this game as a new player just conquer countries and if you start out conquering the wrong country and fail you're going to hurt yourself so that's pretty much the french strategy what they need to do against the English is if you want to start invading right away then so be it that's your prerogative and I'll show you a little naval example here because we didn't really go over fleets and as far as the French fleets go there's some stuff you can do but the overall strategy you can fight Austria and Prussia and still send your fleets out against England and get in a battle. If you get lucky and win a few, then you're ahead of the game and you can start dictating what you're going to do with the English because you just beat them in some naval battles. If you lose, oh well. Who cares? Because you don't need your fleets to win this game. And then the English will bottle you up, get blockaded, and then 
oh well, like I said, you really don't need your fleet. You can try that right away, or you can go this different route. The French are in a good spot to pretty much try to win this game on their own with a little bit of diplomacy and keeping other people out of their hair. They don't need a whole lot of help from people to win this game. Minor territories are outlined in these little black areas with the capital of those areas being the city marked in red. You take that, you control this area. It doesn't matter about this city at all. It's You have to take the provincial, it's called the provincial capital. Okay, Each one has one. You take those, you control that area, and you're collecting this money and this manpower. Every one of them have that. So you're going to be fighting for that. Austria wants it. Prussia wants it. They're, all of them are all in this area of Europe. The majority of them are right here between the French, Prussians, and Austrians. That's why they're usually enemies because they're fighting over this or they come to some agreement to divide this up properly. The British and their strategy. The British need a little more than eight points every economic phase to win and just like the French they're starting on the eight and they need to stay up in that area the problem with the British is they don't have a huge army and therefore they can't win this war on their own at all and the only thing that I have to protect myself from getting conquered is my fleet my fleet is my ace in the hole at the same time the French or other countries don't really want the British to control the entire ocean. If I control the entire ocean, it's going to give me such a huge advantage. Because I can sail anywhere I want, go anywhere I want, help anybody I want, and fight anybody I want. So you kind of don't want that to happen. So there's a dilemma there of how to keep the British in check. Now the British have 100 ships. And the French have 49 ships. The Spanish have 57 ships, I believe. And then the Russians have like 30. The Turks have 22. And then little minor countries like Holland, uh, Denmark, Sweden. They all have like 10, 15 ships. So... There's a lot more ships on the board than just the British have. It's just the British have a lot of them. So the British's main focus in the game, my main focus is going to be the Navy. For example, right here in Spain is Portugal. This starts the game with England as an ally. A lot of these territories will be some major powers allies to start with. And Portugal is one of them. And I think they have like 10 ships. I don't know exact numbers, but when we get into it, we'll find out. So, you know, the Spanish may want to go after Portugal to get rid of those ships. Remember, every ship that you guys can either get on your side, every ship you guys can either get on your side or destroy is less ships for me. And I'm going to be thinking the same way. Every ship I can get on my side or destroy is going to be better for me. So, with that being said, the other thing I have to offer, offer people is money. You're going to find, especially if you're fighting wars, you're going to be hard-pressed to get money. Now, the French start with a lot of money, and then taking more minor countries, they're going to get a lot more money. So, they don't usually have that kind of problem. But every other country will have that problem if you're fighting wars. Britain can help solve that problem by giving money, and that's what I'm going to be offering to people. And it's really done by the trade. Trade, every nation on the board, except the nations I'm at war with, can trade with me for more money. So not only do you get your basic allotment of money for the country you are, but you will add money to that for trading with me. Now, you can be neutral. You don't have to be allied with me to trade. Now, there is an optional rule that says only allies can trade with me. But for the most part, I've seen in the uh, the threads, it can go either way which way we want to use that. It can benefit me and it cannot benefit me. So it doesn't matter what you want to do. It's just if you guys want to stay neutral and still make extra money, then you, you'll want the trade rule in. And trade is just done 
not by moving any pieces around on the board. It's just done in the economic phase for your ports that accept trade that have trade value. You get the money for them, and I'll show you an example. Let's go to Corona. So the British will receive the first number, so I get $1. The Spanish will receive $1. Now, the Spanish have this port. See, the British get $1, the Spanish get 2 So now the Spanish are receiving 3 Go to Cadiz, you know, 2 more dollars. You know, you can keep going up on this. So the total for the Spanish, this island belongs to Spanish, and it doesn't give anything. So the total is 3 This is what the Spanish collect by trading with Britain. 3 Four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, they receive eight dollars. So that's eight extra dollars just for trading with Britain and doing nothing. So you can't pass that up every economic phase, eight bucks. Now, every time you take another country, for example, if the Spanish come over and take Morocco, they will not only get this money, this manpower, but they're going to get this port, this port trading with. England gives them another dollar. So money goes up for the minor countries you take and your country and trade. And then the Spanish have a special rule, and I'll talk to them about that, of, of receiving gold from their South America colonies. Anyways, the British will be looking to trade with everybody. And he'll deny the trade to people if they piss them off. And again, is $8 that terrible to the Spanish? Well, it may be. You're going to find that the Spanish are broke most of the time. And if you're going to be wanting to wage a war, you're going to wish you had money. But again, I'm not the only person you can get money from. You can get, Spanish can get money from France. So remember, everything is to pull, to pull diplomacy and how you can manipulate each other. And what you can get from people. And what you're willing to offer. So the British... I'll be looking to trade with everybody. I'll be looking for people to help fight the French. And I will support anybody fighting the French with money. And that's pretty much what I'm going to do as the English. Now, as far as I may go after minor countries that have fleets so I can get control of the fleets, I may do stuff like that. And again, these are this would be Holland. This would be Denmark. This would be Sweden. Uh, down here in Africa would be Naples. Uh, uh, Egypt may have some. I don't remember offhand. But there's minor countries around. Again, I gave you the sheet. It's the minor. I gave you this card. It's the minor country card. Every country, every minor country is listed right here. And it will tell you what it starts with. Infantry, cavalry, or ships. At the 1805 mark, right here, will tell you what you have what each country has each country will be supplying you with men and stuff like that now I'm gonna go into the fleet section of this because the French the Spanish the Russians the Turks you guys will be interested on how to work the fleets so let's say the French go to set up and the French show me that now these cities that have anchors on them those are ports the French set up two ships there and two ships there. Brest is a good spot for the French to set up because you can take off the, the, the blockade box here is how you enter the ports, okay? You can take off into this zone or into this zone. So basically being in Brest, you can go either way. It's a nice spot. This person, see, takes off through the La Havre box which is right here that means it's in this sea zone so he just comes out right here but if the french set up all four fleets right there i say i look at it because i can choose to set up my fleets last actually not even choose my setup is last when it comes to ships so i will see what the french or and the spanish i'll be interested in how they set up so when i see this i'll be like wow okay they're being pretty aggressive out here in the English Channel. I'm going to have to do something about that. That, to me, I would take as a threat. I would set, let's say on London, three of my fleet factors. Now remember, he has four. 
I'm putting three there. And then I think on Plymouth, I like my other fleets. If I put them all there, that whole stack has to take off together and do the same thing. If, as far as fighting goes, if I want to intercept the enemy, I would have to bring the whole stack. I couldn't separate them. If I want to be able to attack separate stacks, maybe, maybe I want to separate the ships. And I may do that. I don't know. I may put two there and two there. I may do something like this. This is how I would form my fleets. And let's just get the Spanish involved. The Spanish put all three of their fleets on Corona. To me, it's an aggressive setup by the French and the Spanish against the English in this channel and the Atlantic Ocean here. That's the way I would look at it. And I'm going to have to do something about it is what I would be thinking. Now to further make problems, the French have two core with these ships, one core with this ship. The Spanish has one core with those ships. Now it looks real aggressive because if you have a core in the same spot as the fleets, if they're in that city with the fleet, you can transport them. So now I'm thinking, wow, this is really crazy. These guys are doing something. So let's go through a movement. Ships will move this number seven. Every time you enter a box, it counts as one. Every time you enter a C zone, a, Z, a C zone is divided by these lines. So this C zone right here is all one C zone. To enter it, it costs one point. So it's one point to enter a box, one point to enter the C zone, and it doesn't cost anything to move from a port to a box. So the only time your ships can be on the coast like this on land is if they're inside this port, and that's what this represents. They are in the port. You kind of hang them over the coast halfway. That means they're in this port. They're in this port. At no other time can ships be on any part of the land ever. So if they're there, they're in the port. It's your move. Now, anytime you stack ships together, it slows their movement. So right here, your movement's seven, but you have one fleet over that, it becomes a six. If you're transporting troops, you'll lose another movement. So these guys will go down to a five. Now both of these are moving five. All right, so understand that movement. So let's say it's the French turn. And well, let's say it's the naval phase. In the naval phase, naval is done separate from the land. So it's the naval phase. The British are allowed to pick when when they want to go in the naval phase. Just like the French can do on land and get that double move, I can do the same. So I want to see what the French are going to do. Because they won't be able to unload that core until the land phase. So I get an idea to see where they're at. So the French, I'm just for this is just for examples. I'm not saying this is a great strategy. The French, let's say they want to invade Yarmouth. Because I don't have anything there, let's say. He comes, he's allowed to leave the port into the box free of movement. From there, he enters the sea. That's one movement point. Remember, he has a total of five. I can now inter intercept him in this sea zone with anything that is adjacent to this sea zone or in it. That means London, who has a box on this sea zone means I'm adjacent to it. I can intercept with Nelson. I can intercept with Parts, Portsmouth. These two factors, I can come out and intercept this. Now, I can only pick one stack to intercept one stack moving. So, I'm going to pick the Nelson stack. I don't like that he's carrying two core with this. I look at this other one and I see only one core with these two. Well, the more men are more dangerous. So I'm going to bring out Nelson like this. Now, you don't actually move them out. 
the way the rules state, you just announce you're going to intercept this with this. And I'm allowed to because I'm an adjacent to the C zone because I'm in that port which is adjacent to that C zone. I'm going to roll one dice. And you use your card. Everything's done on this card. And there's, inter there's an interception chart. It's right. It's with naval combat. It's right here. For an adjacent C zone, I need to get a one. Nelson allows me to reduce that roll. So, actually, I would need a one or a two. Here we go. I missed. So, I stay where I'm at since I filled. You're allowed to keep going. So, now you enter this new zone. Now, since you entered a new C zone, you're, you can be intercepted again. If I made an attempt earlier of this stack and failed... When he enters a new C zone, I can choose to intercept it again with this same stack. Okay? So since you went to another zone, I can say I'm coming out again. I need a 1 or a 2 because I have Nelson. And this time I got it, so I come out. And the interception is made. Now we're going to have a battle. Now, just for easy record keeping, I'm going to say the French were playing a trick on me. He had two fleets here, but he only had one ship in that one and one ship on that one. So he's trying to trick me. Remember, he has a total of 49. That leaves 47. He has 47 ships there. Just to make the game interesting, I'm going to say I put 15 ships with each of these. So it's 15, 30, 45. So it's 45 went against 47. Now we battle for wind gauge. Wind gauge means whoever gets the wind gauge... He gets to shoot first. The other guy has to lose his ships before he shoots back. In naval battles, it doesn't really matter how many ships are there except when you take off your losses. Then it matters how many ships you had. But as far as rolling a die, there's no modifiers to it at all except for the fact that if you're the British, you get one. And if you have Nelson involved, you get one. So... Excuse me, for the naval combat, it doesn't matter if Nelson's there. It's just British ships, you get one. So, in this combat, we have the wind gauge. Now, for the wind gauge, I will get I will get modifiers for the wind gauge. I get a plus one for British fleet and plus one for Nelson. So, I'm going to get a plus two for my wind gauge. And here's my roll. And I just got a plus two as a three. Here's the French roll. He got a two. So, I win the wind gauge. I will shoot first. So, I have... 45 ships. Here goes my roll. It's just a neat, it's just a simple roll here on this table. Whatever I get, I got a 2. The percentage loss is 10%. It'll be 10% of how many ships I have. And if you use this casualty percentage chart, you go to 10%. I have 45 ships. So here's how many ships. You go up to 20. The chart only goes up to 20. So there's two French losses. Well, I have 45. So I add another 20 which means another two losses, that's four, that's 40, and remember I had 45, so I go to the five, still under the 10% table, because that's what I rolled, gives me one more. So, it was two for the first 20, two for the second 20 is four, and then one more for the five. So, I, destro I destroyed five French ships. You take five out of his total. He has total of 40... It was 47. He loses 5. He has 42 ships now. So, it's not bad. Now the French is going to roll on the table. And he just got a 3. So, he got a percentage better than me. He's at 15%. You go over here to the 15% table. You add... For 40 ships, he just hit a 3. For, for the first 20, a 3. For the second 20, another 3 is 6. And then he has 42. So he has two left over at 15%. He has nothing. There. So he just destroyed six ships. So since the French only lost five and I lost six, guess what? The French just won that battle. So what it's showing you right here, what it's showing you right here, the more ships you can have with your die roll, the more damage you're going to do to the opponent. So keep that in mind. Anyway, since the French won, whoever loses the battle has to retreat either to the nearest friendly port or to the, 
to a adjacent C zone. If you choose to go to an adjacent C zone, the French, the, the opponent gets to tell you which one. Well, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to retreat to Yarmouth, which is the port closest right there. The French entered that zone, and they can continue moving. Because, remember, to come out of here was free, but it cost one to go here, one to go here. So he went one. Really, what he was heading for was Yarmouth. But now he has a British fleet there to contend with. So what he's going to do is just stop right here in the blockade box. And it cost him one more to go in there. So it cost him one, two, three to go there. Remember, he has a total movement of five because he got reduced on his movement because he's stacked and he's carrying men. That's where he stops in the blockade box. In the blockade box means this guy can't come out and intercept right now because he's blocking him. So that stack is done moving. We are going to move this stack now. This stack says, yeah, I'm coming out into this Z zone. Do you want to stop it? Now, again, you don't know where he's going. And I go, yes, I might as well. I'm going to stop him with these guys right here. Now, again, if I, if I keep with the same amount of ships that I had in those, it's 30 ships right here. Uh, I might go 10 each of those because I want these guys who are watching the Spanish to be a little bit heavier with the 30. So let's say 10 each. So I got 20 here. They come out to intercept. I have to get a one and because they're, uh, oh, I don't have Nelson with them. I just have to get a one. And I missed. I got a two. That interception fails. Remember, they never really leave the port. They just stay there. And I failed the interception. So you can continue moving and you say, nope, I'm stopping. So you stop. That's the end of your movement. He cannot be intercepted anymore sitting right there. So now the Spanish come. The Spanish are stacked with two fleets over the over the one fleet with a seven. So you go down two, minus two movement. So his movement's five. And you're going to carry a core. That movement becomes a four. So he only has a four movement now. So he goes in the box for free. And then he moves. He goes one, two. Now, Port Plymouth can choose to intercept right there. Well, I'll tell you what, the Spanish are heading up here, so he doesn't have to go there. He can move into this for free, and he goes one, two, three, and now he can't be intercepted, and he is going to move into this blockade box for four. He has a total movement of four. Now, once he gets in the blockade box, he's done. He cannot enter into this port for free because he does not own it. So he stops. That's the end of the French and Spanish move, and they're putting pressure on the English. Now, to continue with this, it's the English turn. Now, the English, and this is still the naval movement phase. The English decide to make a movement. The first move is they're going to bring these two out into this zone. Now, do the Spanish wish to intercept that? They can intercept that being in the same zone now. Remember, they're not on the coastal hex being adjacent. They're in the same zone. In the same zone, it's a three or less to intercept. But the French aren't there to intercept and fight English. They're there to invade England. So, Because if you lose this fight, you have to go back to the port. You have to retreat. So the French are saying, or to a, an adjacent area, but still they're kicking you out of that area and you want to invade here. So, and you don't want to lose your ships. And remember, you only have two ships there, even though the English don't know that. So you say, no, I'm not intercepting. The English say, okay, I'm going no further. I'm stopping in that zone. This one comes out here. Do you want to intercept that from that box? Now, since, now, since the Spanish are in the blockade box, they're not allowed to intercept out here. The only time they can intercept now is if I enter that box and I say yes I'm entering the box do you wish to intercept <laughs> so for Nelson I'm gonna enter that box now as you enter the blockade box 
you're not allowed to intercept anybody out here only ships that go in that blockade box and so do you wish to intercept and again the french if they lose they have to go back out of that box so he doesn't want to intercept so this is the way we look my movement for the english are done now we go into what's called the naval combat phase now combat will take place if you have any ships that are stacked together which the only places ships can be stacked together you know enemy ships stacked with each other is in a blockade box like this or on the port and since they're stacked together these must fight these must fight this does not have to fight but i'm choosing to attack that anyways so all three of them are fighting again now you can evade combat if you evade combat it's like retreating in other words you're going to have to go back to a port or you go into an adjacent sea area you may not mind going into an adjacent sea area if you lose right so what you go there and now you're in that sea area and you can just invade in your land phase here oh so and so you can try to evade that combat so let's try to evade if you get a one or a two, you evaded that combat, and then you retreat per the normal retreat rules like you lost a battle, and you failed. So you are not retreating. These guys are not allowed to retreat in the box. And just to, I know I'm going to repeat things here, but it's going to take a while for even me and us to understand this. There is no evasion can take place when you're fighting like when you're stacked together like this in a blockade box and the port or during the interception. That's why when you saw the interception earlier, you couldn't invade because I, I succeeded in intercepting you. But you can evade the combat now, except you can't when you're stacked together. Let's continue with this. The French only have two ships. You have to do a wind gauge. Let's do the wind gauge. The British uh, subtract one. I mean, the British will add one. They have a seven. The French can't roll higher than that because they don't get to add. So the British will shoot first. They have 20 ships going against that. They get to add one to their dice is three. That's 15%. Three ships are sunk. And he has to take his losses off first. Since he only had two, these are dead. Next battle this battle is taking place in the blockading port the blockading ships automatically get the wind gauge so there's no roll there so we're going to take this 45 and roll first wow he just really killed him 25 percent so that's 5 10 actually it's 42 ships 5 10 11 the english just lost 11 ships he has to take that 11 now he had 15 he had 45 he lost six in the first round 39 now he has to lose 11 more he has 28 ships so now i get to add one for the british fleet is a five he has 20 percent 20 percent of 29 ships is four and two more six more so the english lose again they go back to Yarmouth. The French lose another six ships. So, so far, the English have lost 17 ships losing these two battles. And it looks like the French, if I can remember, six and six, they've lost 12. So, they're still there. He goes back to that port. Let's conduct this battle. Spanish fight first. 56 ships. He gets a two. 10%. 10% is 2, 4, and then 16. 4, 6. So the English lost 6 ships, and now the English have to have, they have 30. There's 15 per fleet there. And I lost 6 ships, so I've got 24 ships. And I add one to this dice, which is a 3, is 15%. At uh, 24 ships. It's 3, 4. So it's a tie. They both lost 4 ships. 
And then just remember, defender wins ties. So he has to retreat to the friendly, closest friendly port. And since he's in this blockade box, he's going to there. So, so far, you can see here, we've had one, two, three. We've had four naval battles, and the English have only won one. So it's not hard to defeat them. So that's the end of this turn. Now... It goes to the land phase. And then we go whosever land turn it is. The French can choose whatever time they want to go. So the French choose to go first. And now what they're going to do is disembark these troops. You can't leave troops loaded on your ships when the turn's over or they're going to die. Now he disembarks them into this adjacent land area like that. The Spanish do the same. into wells now you have to go in the land area even though there's no garrison here what happens let's just say there's no garrison there what happens is you have to unload in the land phase now once you unload there armies are allowed to de detach troops and pick up troops from garrisons if you own them no problem since this is unoccupied you can move into this vacant city as long as you don't overstack. Remember, a city can hold five men per spire, so they can hold 15 men. So one core can automatically, it takes, your, it takes the entire movement to unload from the ship. So your movement's done, but you're allowed free of movement to go like that, and now you're in the city. This core's outside the city, this is in the city. The Spanish do the same thing. Unload, entire movement, and they move into the city. Now they've taken ports. What we're trying to do for the invasion is take ports so you don't have to forage. But it's no big deal if you forage. These are good forage numbers for your cores. But if you can take a port, then you can just transport men back and forth into the port. Now that this port is taken... These ships have to escape. They can't sit there. And since it's blockaded, they, they get intercepted. So here they come out again, and they get intercepted. And then another battle goes, which we've already said. If the English lose the battle, they have to go back to the port, and then all the ships are destroyed. Nelson would be captured. You just took out those English ships. By taking a port that the ships were in. Okay, so I hope I gave you an idea of how it what it takes to invade and get men on England. Now remember, I will be garrisoning these troops. I probably won't have a lot of men garrison around, but London will be garrisoned probably the most. And maybe just the ports have one or two men on them so if this had a garrison there you wouldn't be able to slip into it you would unload and you would lay siege to it you can automatically move on and conduct a siege combat now i already went over the siege combat i believe with the mechanics of the game but now a siege would take place and that could take you a turn or two in the meantime i would be trying to sink these ships even though you have a siege going on if i still control the port I can still have my ships there, okay? You have to actually take the port to make my ships uh, scuttle. All right, that's the end of the fleet sequence and what to do, British and French strategy. The next section here I'm going to move on to. Now, how you're going to do that is, of course, fighting, creating allies, and getting some miners. What miners do you have? Well, you know, obviously, it's uh, Sweden, Finland. These all can become part of yours. Now, dealing with Sweden, you might get into a little issue with England over Sweden if England wants it. But that's for you and England to work out. The one advantage you have as Russia is you can bargain to use your army to help people. Like, for example... You can help Austria. You can help Prussia. You can help the Turks. 
you can help England. You can do a lot of helping. So if you play your cards right, you demand things from people for their help. Now, of course, you can't get too overly aggressive uh, because then they'll just tell you to, you know, go to hell. But at the same time, you can help these countries do a lot of things. And a lot of people would uh, like your help and invite your help enthusiastically. As far as your armies go, you know, again, it decides who you set up with and who you want to ally with. But Garrison, St. Petersburg, will be one of your most vulnerable spots because of the water. Because of the water. From England, from France, even minor neutrals, even Sweden. So keep this maxed. Because of your spires here, you have 5, 10, you have 15 spires. Max that out with at least 10 to 15 infantry. You keep that max so nobody can take that from you. You might even want to keep a couple here and a couple here. You know, on these other ones, keep one or two militia. Just so all of these in this vicinity here have one or two militia on them. Riga is an important port. Keep, uh, you know, five, six men on that also. Uh, Mix is important. Keep men there. Konisberg. Oh, that's not part of yours. Sorry. Mix. Keep some men on that. As far as Moscow goes, which is way back here, it may be threatened once St. Petersburg falls. So, you know, you can keep a few there, but you're not really worried about it yet. But Kiev, down in this area by Austria, I'd keep that garrisoned with some good amount of men. And then the rest of your armies, you're going to decide where you what you want to do with them. Now, this Russia player has played this game before, and he found out how difficult it was to fight Turkey and come down in this area, especially with his supply and his depots and not having ships in the Black Sea. So he learned a lesson there. He knows all that. But his typical enemies will probably be Turkey and Austria and Prussia or because he's got to fight too. Like the French, you're going to have to get up there on political points to, to get your victory points. You're going to have to fight. So as a Russian, you would watch what the French player do, the Austria, the Prussians, and the Turks. That's going to be your main focus. If you see the French player attacking Austria and or Prussia, then you know he's trying to fight his way up into the victory point. Your job should be the despoiler because you're not going to have a chance to win if you let France do that. And what I mean by despoiler is you send some troops in and you help Austria, you help Prussia to not fall so easily. You know, you can't help it if they fall, and sometimes you won't even care if they fall. You just want to make it a little tough on the French and make them spend more money than they were planning to and make them lose a few battles. That would be your job as the Russian, to keep the French under control and give you a chance of winning the game. Now, with that being said, if you want to plan with Russia to divide up Austria and Prussia in the kingdoms and gain a lot of territories, that would be your prerogative. Again, those are different strategies. I won't know what you have in mind. I'm just talking basically if, if you want a chance to win the game and you see France fighting these two countries and trying to take them over, then you want to make it difficult on him. And the last thing for defense, if countries decide to attack you, let's say Austria, Prussia, and Turkey wants to attack you, because Turkey would like Georgia here. Um, you you don't try to fight them on your borders, on your borderline there. You don't try to fight them on your borders here. A good plan is to let them come in a little bit. They're going to run into the same problems that you had last time trying to fight Turkey. Supply, moving armies in, and then you have Cossacks, special forces that can run around without supply and cut them off. So don't be afraid to pull back and make armies come in to get you just remember to uh garrison cities to slow them down remember you would be a delaying action until you decide to put up the big fight somewhere with your entire army that would be your defense the other thing is turkey if you're gonna plan a strategy against turkey then put some ships down in the black sea to at least help get across here and cause some threat at least you know, you have three fleet markers, at least one, down in this area. But other than that, just going straight on and attacking Turkey, that's your prerogative. 
and you can also hit Turkey in this area right here. This is all Turkey domain right here. So you can hit them two ways. You don't have to come back in the desert. You can come in the front here. All right, that's about all I got for Russia. Let's talk Austria. Now, Austria is almost going to be confronted by France most of the time. Just because the French can usually take down Austria and the Prussians and gain victory points for doing it. That doesn't mean nothing for the Austrians. Remember, the Austrians have to live by allying themselves with somebody. The French, you know, would be wise to ally, but they probably don't need it if they really don't want to, but they don't want everybody ganging up on them. Well, that's not true for Austria. Austria will need help. And usually the best partner are the Prussians. You two, I would say, as new players, should ally and fight the French together. You will go down together or you'll live together. But once defeat becomes an inevitable, what you don't want to do is surrender to the French with an unconditional surrender term. Don't do that. That's going to be hurtful to you and, and benefit the French. You want to try to, to surrender conditionally. So if enough of you are putting enough fight into the French and he's not just sweeping over you, Let's say the Russians help. Let's say the British decide that, wow, because remember, me as a British, I'm going to be looking at any wars the French are doing. And if he's gaining too much power too fast, I will do everything I can to slow that down. So your point is, your strategy is to go ahead and fight the French. As a matter of fact, it's almost absolutely necessary that you fight the French. Because we can't just let the French sit there and collect money and, and a huge army and get every one of his corps filled. That's crazy. We have to be fighting him. Not we. Well, again, this is part of the, my British strategy, though, too. But as you as Austria, you want to be fighting the French to keep his money down. And you need to try to supplement your money some way. Either get help from the Prussians get help from the Russians, get help from Britain, get help from Turkey. Those are your main areas of focus here, is to get help and fight the French. But do not lose yourself to total destruction. End a war conditionally when you can. Then come back and fight them again. And then end the war conditionally once again. And you're going to have to use the economic manipulation to stay up on your table. Austria needs seven and a half points, so they can't quite sit in the zero box either. So you would need to get yourself up by alliances. So the Prussians can collect 7.2, so barely a little over seven victory points a turn. And they can come close to winning this game before it's over. And that means they don't have to do anything. However, the French aren't going to let them sit there and do that. The Russians won't let them. So the Prussians are usually in the same boat Austria is in that they're going to fight. They're going to get conquered. Try not to have to give yourself an unconditional surrender if you can. And again, make sure you garrison your important cities like Königsberg, Danzig, you know, Magdeburg, and of course Berlin. Put garrisons in them to slow any invader down as much as you can. Okay? Uh, Saxony right here. Now, even though this is Prussia, Saxony is yours you'll start with. And we'll go over that. You start with some miners. Well, this is already yours. So having Lipsing here, Maddenberg is a nice little line here for you. Breslau usually right along here is a nice little defensive line for you to have garrisons and then you're keeping your cores right here ready to jump on people. And again, if you can make allies with Russia and Austria, even Prussia to not fight, it's going to be beneficial to you to not get in a war. More than probably half the other people here to not fight, you can still win the game, but other than that, Now, Turkey, to me, is probably one of the best 
defensive areas because they're way in the back in the corner here. The problem they have will come from Russia, Austria, or the ocean. About that simple. And again, you can make treaties to protect your borders with these guys or not. But one thing the Turks have is there's a lot of territories down here that are minor countries that nobody owns. And this is usually what the Turks and the Spanish and even the English may get involved in in trying to fight. Also, territories here in Italy that are readily to be taken by the Spanish, the British, and the Turks. So this whole area is open to the Turks. The Turks, their victory conditions say they need about 7.2 victory points every economic phase to win the game at 1815. Um, that's not very hard to do. The Turks can stay in the zero box and collect seven, so they're not that far off. So a few alliances, a few conquered miners, and they can get more victory points, and then with economic manipulation, they can be up there. And again, the people that may not want this to happen or can do something about it will be the Russians, the Spanish, and the Austrians. But on a defensive level, look at this territory right here. See the, the black border and uh, the border right here. This whole area is Anatolia. It's worth four and four. That's what I brought up before, these cities that have the red name. They control this territory, and as long as you own the city that's red, you're going to collect the points. Enemies, opponents can be in here with cores. They can even be in here, but as long as you control the city, you're going to collect your money. So Constantinople is your national capital for all your empire. As long as you own that, you can still collect all your money from any other territories that you control. If you lose Constantinople, then you don't get to collect anymore. That's why with Russia, Russia has two capitals, national capitals. They have Moscow and they have St. Petersburg. So someone trying to conquer them has to take them both. And that's why you protect St. Petersburg as heavy as you can because it can be invaded by the sea. And the seaborne invasions and people moving ships around is very, very tricky and you might not see it coming. But they still have to take Moscow. With the Turks, it's just one capital. However, the Dardanelles right here is a very tough spot to get into. No ship is allowed to come in here unless they have siege to this city. So as a Turkish player, just know that you don't let an army come in here and siege the, uh, besiege you here and then ships can't come in here. So the only way somebody can pass through this from the, this sea, the Aegean to the Black, is through the Darnells. Well, you see this area, which is the Darnell section, the dark blue. It, no ships can enter that unless they control Constantinople or that is under siege. So you can actually see opponent coming to jack you up either by sea because they're going to have to land troops, come over to fight it. The other army that probably would have the best chance because Russia would still have to land troops then march to it if you keep this built up with garrison 5 10 15 20 25 men can be on that it has two uh, siege fletches which means it's really good on the siege it would take an army three four turns probably to take that by then you can have you know all your feudal corps go in and your armies over here so as long as you keep a garrison there, you probably don't have to be around here defending this. Austria would probably be the only one that can really come and march on this and take it effectively and then have an ally such as Spain or Britain come over with some ships and land some more troops. But defensively, Turkey, you probably are pretty easy, pretty capable of controlling Constantinople while the rest of your army is out conquering just keep garrisons here. And then all these have feudal cores. And I'll talk to you about feudal cores you know, when we set up your army. Uh, you really have to master the feudal core. If you can understand the way the feudal core works, you're going to do very well. So other than that, Turkey, you can really ally yourself with Austria, Russia, 
or one of the other. Pit one of those against the other guy. Make yourself allies with one and fight the other. Either way you go. You can pick anybody on this board that will ally with you. And most guys won't have a problem allying with you. Because they have nothing to do with you over here in this section. To gain your empire, we'll talk about that. Is taking a lot of these territories in Africa. So as Turkey, as long as you're cool on your main fronts here with Russia and Austria, you can be down here conquering these territories and, and gaining your empire back. Lastly, Turkey, you could take the route of talking to everybody on the board, trying to find out if they want your assistant to be a thorn in somebody's side. For example, against the Russians, the Austrians, the Spanish, the British, and the French, I would think those four nations, uh, what I named five, uh, Russia, Austria, France, Spain, and Britain, yeah, those five nations, you could be a thorn in their side, So, and you can offer assistance to any one of those against the others. So remember, playing countries against countries here is a good tactic. Somebody in this game is going to be weak, uh, politically minded weak, that you can take advantage of, always and we'll see who that person is so let's talk spain spain needs they start at seven and they need 325 spain has two problems france and britain spain has one thing that both these countries want and that's the fleets. They have a lot of ships. France could use them and England could use them. So Spain needs to be able to use this to their advantage and control both the French and the British. There's many ways to go about this, so I can't describe them all to you. But you want to offer your ships up as leverage. If you absolutely outlay yourself with, let's say, France, then you automatically made England an enemy, and England's going to try to destroy your navy. It's just as simple as that. And once your navy goes, you're pretty much history for the game. Now, if you ally yourself with the British, you're going to piss the French off. And like I said, and you're going to piss the French off. The French can come in here early in the game, the first year, and probably wipe you out. And you can't do much about it. Your guerrillas won't be able to help because it's early in the game. So you, you don't want to start out pissing off people. You kind of want to stay neutral and offer your help to both. Remember, all this is done behind their back. And you use your ships as leverage. What Spain can do, if they want to stay out of this quagmire of problems they operate down here the only people they have to really worry about if they're going down here and into Italy is making sure the French are okay with you bothering Italy they may well be as long as your ships aren't helping England and then coming down here in Africa no one will really care if you're taking Africa except the Turks and then you just have to deal with Turks now with that being said me as an English player I want to control the ocean. And so if I see you operating all over the water down here, I kind of have two ways I think about it. One, I don't want nobody operating in the waters, and I'm going to try to do everything I can to diminish that. And I'm going to get whoever I can to help me diminish that. Second, I may just say screw the Mediterranean and let you operate down there as long as you're not operating up here. I'll be interested up there in the north as well as down here. So, the Spanish, you got a hard task to keep the French and the English warm to you, friendly to you, until you decide it's to go on one side or the other. You kind of wait to see who's doing what. For example, if the French try to get aggressive with the English with their fleets and the English destroy their navy, you're in trouble. You didn't you don't want to be on the French side with that. So you kind of wait to see 
what side is better to join. But that's up to you. It depends what you want to do. See this little country right here, Portugal? This starts as an English ally. You have that leverage. If you decide, decide to come in here and attack this, you could make an enemy of Britain right away. And then we're going to get into the fleet stuff real quick. Or you may not if you have the French backing you. What's Portugal going to give you? It's going to give you some more money and some more men. But remember, your main accomplish is to get, you know, about eight victory points a turn. If you want to win the game earlier, try to get up at eight or nine victory points. So to do that, either make alliances or win battles. So that's about all I got for the Spanish. The Spanish usually feel like they're free to operate down in the Mediterranean without harassment. If the British let them, because the British will be the only thing to do something about it. Or they just sit tight for a while. Sometimes to me, that's the best play. You sit tight and you wait to see what happens with the other wars that are going on. Or you wait till someone really wants you on their side. Some people may come begging to you for your help. And then you got them where you want them. Because then you can make some bigger demands than you're usually used to. The one thing right here is Gibraltar. Something here with the Spanish. You see this little red circle right there? This is Gibraltar. Now it doesn't give me any money or manpower. But I own it. And it's a base on this border of this sea area and this sea area. So I as a British will like the base here. And I can move either way as the spanish thinking if you can take that let me explain this to you one i'm allowed if you come in here and lay siege to this in other words you siege it because you in order to assault it you have to succeed on the siege table you can see the spires on there are two of them that means it's it can hold five men for each spire so it can hold it can garrison i can keep a garrison there of 10 men now, the more people you have there, if it, if it gets besieged, well, obviously, the more people you have in there, it kind of works against you, and your supply, you can't supply them all, and they'll die. But the less men you have in there, it's easier to keep them supplied. However, when an army attacks it, uh, they may not last as long because you have less men. So there's this little counter thing going. But we're going to say, for example, I have five men garrisoning Gibraltar and the Spanish come over and decide to attack it so what they do is you see this little red box little red circle here that's Gibraltar they walk in and they lay siege to it because I'm inside the city the Spanish don't control it you just don't attack a city outright it has to be uh, put under siege your core goes on top of it and now you're laying siege to it and you can attempt to assault it using the siege table and what you do is you have to roll the dice and you have to get higher than and this says a if you roll a one you're the people who are being besieged the garrison can sort you out and attack if you roll a two or three, there's no result. If you roll four or higher, you had breached the wall. And then you're allowed to do a couple things. You can offer surrender to the garrison. Now, you can see this has three of these black fletches on it. That means it's a pretty good siege city. You won't see too many cities at all like that. Uh, I haven't really looked over the entire board, but I don't remember seeing any. But you get to subtract off the dice how many black uh, notches there are. They're fletches is what we call them. So automatically you got to subtract three off your dice. Now remember you need a four or higher. So if you have a six, if you roll a six, subtract three, it's a three. It means you're going to fail the siege every time. So the other thing that matters is how many men I have there. So if I have five men it says you get to add one to the dice if it's under garrisoned by more than five men 
of what it maximum is. Its maximum garrison could be 10 while I have 5. That means I'm not more than 5 lefts. So you wouldn't get a plus for that. So your siege assault would fail for that roll and you have to wait till next turn. You just sit there and lay siege. Now in the meantime when my turn comes I have to supply those men. I got two ways of supplying it. I can put a depot. I'm allowed to build a depot. You're allowed to build a depot in any city you own even if it's sieged. Even if it's under siege. So I'm allowed to put a depot here anytime I want and as long as I have a depot up here in my main English supply source all I have to do is have a fleet in one of these cities, either here or here, but I do have to have a depot in both, but I only need to have a fleet in one of them. I'm automatically using depot supply, and I will never lose the men. You will never be able to take it. So Even though you're laying a siege to it, it comes in through the port, and I'm supplied, no problem. Now, if you want to block that, you put a ship in the blockading box, and that blockading box blocks anything from going in and out of there. And now I would have to attack your fleet and fight it. Now, or these men are allowed to forage just like any other army. Instead of paying for a supply depot, you can forage. The forage value when you're inside a city is you don't use the number, that little blue number you see around the board there, the foraging value. You have to use how many spires you have. There's two spires, so the siege supply of this city is to two. That means I got to roll a two or less. Anything higher, I have to lose men. Remember, I only have five in there. So you would want to blockade this and not let me use depot supply, and I will start losing men, theoretically. And so blockading that port means we're going to be getting into fleet battles. So it's just pretty much simple as that. Block, to blockade any port, you just put your ships inside the box. Remember, I was showing in the fleet how to do things. You can enter a box. You just can't enter the port if you don't control it. But the box, you can sit there all you want and blockade the port. And not sh Every time a ship tries to come out of there, you can intercept it. If enemy ships try to come in, let's say it's an enemy's port, they try to come in, they have to enter the box first, and then you intercept. So... Blockading a port stops, help you know, lets you intercept and fight anything coming in and out of there. So that would just be an example of me holding on to Gibraltar because I wouldn't want to lose Gibraltar and you trying to take it. It would immediately put us at war because, of course, you can't even attack unless you're at war with me. But that would be one of the things that I would spend my time and my navy uh, fighting Spanish ships. So it doesn't really matter how many men you put to assault that I'm gonna be able to see supply it so again it comes down to your ships once again when it comes to Gibraltar now this little red arrow between Cadiz and Tangier that's a crossing arrow it means your men can walk across there however if there's enemy ships in this sea zone it has to be in the same sea zone as the crossing arrow you won't be able to cross that either so if the British want to try to hold on to that and keep you from that, we can have little problems there too. So there's little little things that the British can be a thorn in your side if you're against them, or if you just want to stay neutral. You can do you can go into Africa or Italy and not have the British bother you. So, anyways, that's about it for strategies little more detailed strategies I will talk to each empire when we set up so the next thing we're gonna do is set up this game and the Russians set up first and then Turkey is second 